Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of Reach the World's live, live stream series with the Weddell, oh, sorry, the Endurance 22 expedition. I was going back in time there a little bit as I was reliving some old, old exciting memories from, from the past. Uh, my name is Chris Ahern. I am Director of Partnerships for Reach the World, and I am so excited to speak with you today uh, to, to learn a little bit more of the history of the Endurance 22 expedition and the Imperial Trans-Antarctic expedition that led to all of the exciting and amazing work that the folks aboard the SA Agullis II uh, have, been, have done over the past two plus months. I am so excited to be able to speak with you all, uh, where we have a very special guest today. Uh, that and but before we bring him on, I do want to to express a special welcome to a number of our guests who are already joining us. And if you haven't already, please use use the chat to tell us where you're from. So welcome to everyone who's joining us. We have folks from India, from New Jersey, from New York City, from Texas, uh, from from St. Louis, Brazil. Um, from all over, and we will. We do have a wonderful group of students who will be joining us, uh, not too far away from Reach the World's headquarters, um, over in uh, over from PS1 in Brooklyn, New York. We'll 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 say hi to to those amazing students in just a little bit. But the next thing I'd like to do is a little bit of time travel, a little bit, because we're going to be speaking with someone who is a few hours ahead of us. Uh, across the pond, if you will, across the Atlantic Ocean from New York City in London. Um, his name is Steve. He's from the Royal Geographic Society. So hello, Steve. Welcome to our live stream. Hi, Chris, and hi, everybody who's, who's joined us today. Really pleased to join with you. Um, my name's Steve. I'm Steve Brace. I'm head of education here at the Royal Geographical Society. And I think it's about, it's about four o'clock here in, in London, but really pleased to be Join all of you, whether you're on US time or elsewhere in Brazil and India. And um, I'll just say a few words about the Royal Geographical Society just to sort of set the scene. We've been around since 1830. We promote geography and we work with schools, with universities, with geographers and a whole wealth of jobs. And we support fieldwork and expedition and expeditions. And Shackleton, when he traveled to Antarctica almost 100 years ago now, he received some funds from the RGS to help him do, do that expedition. And we hold really important material that was collected from the expedition, including some fo the, the photographic record. And I'll show you one of those glass plates later in our chat. But that just sets the scene. I'm here in a room that used to be our library. And I can't say for certain which chair Shackleton might have sat in when he visited the RGS, but he certainly visited the RGS to look at our maps and our atlases when he was planning many of our expedition travels. And on his return, various dinners were held in his honor and honor of his crew as well. So we've got lots of links with Shackleton. If you Google up our building, you'll find a, a statue of him outside our building as well. So you'll be able to follow that up in your classrooms as well. So I'll hand back to Chris to see if we've got any questions or where we might start off from as well. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so very quickly, I would do. I do like to. Would like to make a couple additional welcomes. We, we've we've seen some other folks joining us from the chat. So, um, hello to all of you in Virginia, to France, Ireland. Uh, we see some folks from the Explorers Club in um, in the, the Southern California chapter in Los Angeles. Um, hello and welcome, especially for those of you in LA. You're you're joining us at the beginning of your day, so thank you so much for that. Uh, waking up early with a probably a big cup of coffee as we as we speak with Steve. Um, so before, I know Steve, I know you have a presentation, but I, I think you're right. Let's let's jump right in. Let's ask our friends uh, at PS One uh, all the way in Brooklyn, New York. To, um, to see if there's any students who have any questions, just to start off with. Um, sit down, sit down. What has, have you done any um, other, um, have you found any other interesting artifacts in other ships? Um, do you want to tell me your name? I didn't hear it at the start, mm -hmm. sorry. What's your name? Etta. My Etta. Etta. Uh, really nice to hear. Um, the, what the RGS did, probably 100 years ago, 150 years ago, support many of these expeditions with money and funds, and whether it was ships or people traveling on land. So we've been involved with the Endurance Expedition, Endurance 22 Expedition, and I know you've all been following it in, 
in PS1 in New York City, which is fantastic. So I've, I've not been to Antarctica, unfortunately. I know some people have been lucky to travel to Antarctica. I've been still here in the UK. But what we've been doing is working to share the news of the expedition to schools here in the UK and with Reach the World across the globe as well. So it, we've been sort of, what you sometimes hear in expeditions is people left at base camp. We've been left at base camp for, to share the news rather than to be on the, on the agreed list to doing the, the sort of sharp end work trying to find the wreck. I, I will say though that um, that and we will we'll be able to show these in a little bit. But those those amazing photos that that Steve has behind him, um, those those were our prints from that were taken from um, from the expedition from the Imperial Trans Antarctic Expedition. And that's a little bit. It's actually a little bit of, of what Steve's going to be talking to us today about the um, some of the things that they were able to bring back. One thing that that RGS does have that I don't think that you have necessarily the ability to show us today, but this is an encouragement to anyone whenever they are in London to be able to see or to go online to visit the Royal Geographical Society, is that the James Caird, um, the, the, the boat that was, um, that was used to bring Sir Ernest Shackleton uh, and a small group of people to find help so this is the boat that was sailed from Antarctica, from Antarctica to Elephant Island, um, which was an uninhabited, so no one lived there, island, where they, where they put most of the crew. And then a small group of them took what they thought was the most seaworthy vessel, the James Caird. And they brought the James Caird um, hundreds of miles over rough seas to South Georgia Island. And South Georgia Island had people who were living there. And so as, as an important remembrance of the um, amazing work that Sir Ernest Shackleton and his crew had to be able to survive, um, the James Caird is there. And so, and so it's, it's an amazing example of, of what I think to be one of the coolest artifacts basically anywhere, <laughs> if you're interested at all in the expedition. So amazing question, but I think that's a great transition. Let's, let's go into a little bit of, the, of what you want to share with us today, Steve. Okay, so if we just pull up, um, I've got a couple of maps just to talk about at the start, just to set the scene. So um, uh, there we go. Th thank you, Z. Um, this is a map of what people knew about Antarctica when Shackleton was born in 1874. So 100 years old, this map is from, and this is part, we have a million maps here at the RGS. And as you can see, the big word written right across Antarctica is unexplored. People had only ever reached the edge of Antarctica, the ice shelf, occasionally during the Antarctic winter when the, the sea ice has retreated, got to the shore and seen land. But very few people had actually traveled to Antarctica at that time at all. It was barely any, barely any understanding of what the interior of this massive white continent, the windiest in the world, the coldest in the world, barely 500 sorry, barely 5,000 people live there even today, and they're mainly scientists during the summer. So it's at that time when Shackleton was growing up and he was born in Ireland and then um, went to school, trained to join the Merchant Navy, which at that time was, was sailing ships around the world, taking cargo to lots of places. And then at the turn of the 1900s, he wanted to get into polar exploration. It was a way of sort of seeking for fame, seeking fortune, becoming you know, more known in, in Edwardian society at the time. So he joined an expedition led by a man called Captain Scott, and that took him to Antarctica, first of all. But then Shackleton wanted to make his own way. And the, the expedition we've all been following, which is often known as the Endurance Expedition, the Trans-Imperial Expedition, is shown on the next slide. And if we just go on to that, I'll just say what they were trying to do. The key thing that nobody done at that time, when, when um, Shackleton sailed in 1914, even though uh, two explorers, Captain Scott and Abinson, had actually reached the South Pole, the very bottom of the earth, nobody had traveled right across Antarctica. So what Shackleton wanted to do in the Trans-Antarctic Expedition is sail, and you can see it at the, the top of this map, it says South Georgia. So all the way down, from the UK to South Georgia, sail through the Weddell Sea to the coast of Antarctica. He would have stayed there, formed a base, and then a team of his would have traveled into the, the interior, right to the center of the, the South Pole, where you can see in the middle of the map, and then continued their expedition 
over the South Pole through Antarctica, the Ross Sea. And he actually had a separate um, expedition that had gone into the Ross Sea to lay uh, dumps of food, of fuel, of supplies, so that once he reached the pole, he'd hoped to have those supplies from him on the second part of his journey. Of course, as we all know, his ship got trapped in the ice in the Weddell Sea. The endurance was then crushed and lost. And it's only earlier this month, on the 5th of March, that, that his ship was rediscovered. But I'm just going to just bring the globe a bit closer to the, the camera for you, just to show how far they all had to travel. So where are we? Uh, let me find the UK. So I'm here in the UK. It's just a bit shiny on the globe. And Shackleton sailed with his crew down to South America, past Brazil. I know some of you have dialed in from Brazil, down all the way to Argentina. Then he sailed to the islands of South Georgia, just under my finger. And his aim was to sail into this area called the Weddell Sea. And that's where the endurance was lost and crushed. His, he'd hoped to get right to the bottom of the world, to the South Pole, keep going and this get to this area called the Ross Sea. Then he just sailed to New Zealand and sailed home. But of course, as we know, there was too much ice in the Weddell Sea. And as you can see in the photo, I'll point the other way, actually, the photo here, the endurance got stuck in the ice and they had to camp on the ice and they couldn't get the ship out. And it was eventually crushed. And we have this amazing story of Shackleton being able to get all his men safely back. So if we're looking at the world from the South Pole, that's what we're looking at. We have the Weddell Sea over here and then moving over to the Ross Sea. So I, I do want to want to uh, echo something that Steve was just telling us. Uh, and, and specifically as we were looking at that very first map, um, from 1874, I think that right around uh, Sir Ernest Shackleton's birth, um, the 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 fact that it was unexplored as of 1874, it, it this was an area that it it was it was blank. No one knew anything that was there. Were there mountains? Were there volcanoes? And I'm saying that because now we know that there are such things. There is Mount Erebus, for example. Uh, because of expeditions like Sir Ernest Shackleton, like um, Sir Robert Falcon Scott, uh, like Roald Amundsen, um, who are some of the really important names that I'm, I'm repeating to you all so you can hopefully, some of you at home can take notes and look them up on your own um, and the work and the incredible things that they did. But, they, but people like Sir Ernest Shackleton, um, they said, okay, this is unexplored and there's important things for us to learn here whether it's just to chart, to figure out what the heck is here, or to say, I want to be the first one to be able to claim that this is something that we can do. And, and so uh, Sir, Sir Ernest Shackleton was a part of, of the, the, the second group, the second expedition to ever make it to the South Pole. Um, they, were, they were beaten just by, by a, a few days by, by the Amundsen expedition. But the overall, the incredible work laid laid for um, was the groundwork was laid for this, and and it just shows the importance of and to for all of you to be thinking about saying, what are the ways that we can be excited about adventure and what is unexplored, but also, what are the things that we can do to contribute to how we know what we know about the world? Uh, there's a lot of things under the sea that we don't know about, and there are things that. We we're now learning under the sea. For example, now we know where endurance is and we only learned that less than a month ago. So this is an opportunity for you to think, what are the things that are unexplored in our world now? And so you you all out there, think about what, what maybe you can be the, the first one to discover yourselves. Um, so on, on that note, let's bring, let's go back to Brooklyn, New York. Let's see if there's another student who has a question before we go on, um, go on to uh, another element of the presentation. <laughs> Remember to introduce yourself, okay? My name is Faith, and I want to know if the um, the James Card boat is in the um, in the Royal Geographic Society. Thanks, Faith. Um, uh, the boat mainly stays at Shackleton's um, former school, which is called Dulwich College, which is in London. So if you come to London to see the RGS and you go to Dulwich College, you'll be able to see it there. And there's also a replica of the boat that's mm. always on show at a museum in Cambridge 
called the Scott Polar Museum. Mm. And just to give people a, an idea of the size of this small boat, it wasn't the one people found on, on the seabed because it came back to the UK. The James Keg was only 22 feet long. So probably not much longer than your classroom behind you. And five men stayed in this boat <laughs> and sailed 800 miles across the Southern Ocean. And the waves were so high at one point, Shackleton thought they were looking at the sky and there was a wave so high and it crashed all the way over the, the, the boat they were sailing in. They also, they think one thing that they were really worried about was ice can form on the boat. And if too much ice forms on the top of the boat, it'll capsize and sink. So actually there's, there's a, a little um, photo a bit further in the presentation, if Steve can, can pull it up of the boat sailing uh, towards the end. Um, what the men had to do with small little hand axes is slide along the, uh, I think it's all that one actually, uh, if they had to slide along the, that's it, yeah, here we are. You can see they, they covered the top of the boat with canvas, they had two small sails, and they saw ice, on a couple of the days when they were sailing, saw ice was forming that was too heavy for the boat. They had to slide without a rope on that sort of canvas on the top of the boat with a little axe to chip away the, the ice to make sure that boat didn't sink. And they nearly were, were taken off by waves. The other thing to say is they sailed almost 800 miles. So you're in New York City. It's about the distance to Atlanta or Chicago, give or take. Or if anybody's in London, it's about from London to Madrid or, or Berlin. The weather was so bad that they could only do what was called take a sextant's reading, which was a way of navigating. It's an instrument where you look at the stars to find out where you are. They were only able to do two of these readings. They didn't have GPS. They didn't, I've got my phone here. They didn't have Google map on their phone and all that sort of thing. They had to do these calculations to find out where they were. If they'd have made a very, even a microscopic error in their calculations, they'd have missed South Georgia by miles and miles and miles. But the navigator, a guy called Worsley, who was the captain of the Endurance, was a really good navigator. And even on just two very small readings, was able to get them towards um, South Georgia. You can see that South Georgia in the background. Even though they knew there were people living on South Georgia where they could get rescued, the way the winds took them, they arrived on the south of, south of the eye, sorry, the side of South Georgia that didn't have a town, a small village. So they had to find a small beach to bring the, the James Caird onto. And then they had to climb these massive mountains that nobody's ever climbed before. And many people have failed climbing since. And there's a little picture of Grit Vicken uh, that Zeke might be able to find me looking into the harbour. And you can see these massive mountains. Here we are. Shackleton and two of his men climbed over those mountains. You can imagine they've been in this boat sailing for 800 miles. They barely got any sleep. They didn't have equipment. They had one, one coil of rope. They knocked some nails through their boots so they could, could um, have better grip on, on the ice and the, uh, the snow. And they had a couple of axes to help them. And they climbed these uncharted mountains. At one point, they were so tired, they wanted to go to sleep. And Shackleton knew if they went to sleep on the mountain, they were so tired, they'd never wake up. And they'd probably die of frostbite and exposure you know, for, for the cold. So what he did is he allowed them to sleep, just his, his two, the two members of his crew, for two minutes and then kicked them awake and said, you've had two hours, that'll be enough. And then they carried on their journey. <laughs> and then into, it, it, I think sometimes as a leader, you have to sort of be very uh, clever with the way you, you work with people. But it's an amazing thing because had, had they wanted to sleep, they probably wouldn't have been able to get rescued. And you can see where the ships are in this, this harbour called Gritvik. And, this, yeah. and, and, and so I, I do want to remind everyone that we actually had a, a, a live stream with Tim Jacob last week where Tim shared some of the footage because the SA Agullis 2 actually made their way to Gritviken and, and some of the expedition members, including Tim, were able to um, get to Gritviken, see the remains of the whaling uh, of, of the, the whaling uh, town that used to be there. It is, it is abandoned now because no one is allowed to hunt whales in that part of the world. And, and so he, he was able to, to show what it looks like now. And, it, and you can see it doesn't look that different from, from this picture from 1914. 
uh, it's it's quite quite incredible. It's a it's a great it's a, a great question uh, about the about great uh, about the the cared and and I think it's an important point for Steve to mention that imagine rowing a boat, walking, doing something very very slowly, eight hundred miles, a distance from New York to Chicago, and you having to do that not just in calm weather but some of the worst weather you can imagine. That's what they had to do in order to get themselves and all the other people they had left behind in Elephant Island rescued. And they did it. Uh, it's, it's one of the most amazing parts of the entire expedition. Um, we have two questions actually coming from the chat that I wanted to, to make sure to ask you. Um, so Steve, no, um, so our, our friends in St. Louis wanted to know, has there ever been a traveling exhibit on the Endurance Expedition? I believe there has in the States. Um, but yeah. do you know of anything that the Royal Geographical Society has done? Yeah, we, we have, uh, we've got an exhibition on at the moment. And if you find our website, you just Google it, Royal Geographical Society, you, you'll find us online very easily. There's a website and there's an online version of that as well. We have also worked with the Bowers Museum and people like the Explorers Club to share this work in, 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 in the US and elsewhere. So you might be, be fortunate to be in a place where the exhibition showing. And I think there's a tour being talked about later on this year. I don't have the dates and the venues yet, but that that can be, uh, you, you might be able to find that and, uh, and possibly be able to see like some of the amazing images we, we've got behind us here and some of the other that, you know, have more information about the story of Shackleton, his crew, and the the amazing story of endurance. I, I have, a, I have a, a feeling that the, um that that given the amazing work of the SA Agullas 2 and the Endurance 22 expedition, that there will probably be some amazing traveling uh, <laughs> exhibition uh, in the very near future. And, and I will be, be first in line to see what that is. From, from what I've heard of the, the footage and things that they've taken on, there's going to be a documentary with um, with National Geographic here in the States that we're, I, I already can't wait for. Uh, but I, I, I think this is uh, it's going to be amazing. So um, we have some of our folks in Allen, Texas, who want to know, and this is a great question, and I think, Steve, you're, you're uh, a, a perfect person to be able to answer this. How did Hurley, the photographer, manage to keep the glass plate photos intact? Did he develop them while on the expedition, or did he wait to develop them after they returned? And I think this might be a chance for you to, to come back into your presentation um, yeah. as well to talk about that camera. Yeah, absolutely. Should we just go to this slide and I'll, I'll talk about this. Uh, yeah, here we go. So we're all used to having our phones. I've got my little phone here with a camera on. We can take a million pictures all in one go and edit them and all the rest of it. Frank Hurley took a, a camera that's shown here. They're really heavy. And if you want a comparison, they weigh. The, the camera that Frank Hurley took weighed about the same as 125 iPhones or I've got a Huawei, Huawei phones. So that's the weight of the camera. And he took a limited supply of what are known as glass plates. And these are plates of glass that, we, that the image was photographed onto, and then he developed them in a dark room in endurance. It's a really good question from Texas about how he saved the, the images, because you can imagine, and I'll show you one in a moment. I need to put some gloves on, but I'll show you one in a moment. These plates are really delicate. And what Hurley had done, he'd, he'd taken about 400 pictures developed them and sealed them in metal cans and soldered them. So he welded the cans together to keep them airtight and to keep them protected and to keep them waterproof. These were in the, the hold, the hull of the endurance. And of course the endurance was trapped in the ice and being squeezed by the ice, started to take water in. And that's when they had to abandon ship and camp on the ice. Hurley went into the ship as I, I think I'm correct, and he had to swim through some of the water to gather some of these canisters of, 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 his, of his films, bring them out, and then him and Shackleton, the thing they knew was they were going to have to get off the ice in small boats. They might have to march across the ice sheet. And the thing, one of the key things they all knew is they only have to be able to take things that were essential. So all of the men were only allowed to take two pounds of personal items, you know, whether letters from their, their wives and children, Bibles, and so on. And two pounds is about a bag of pasta, a bag of flour, that sort of weight. That's all you had as a member of the crew. 
there was a man who had a banjo called Hussey. He was allowed to take the banjo because they thought that was the good to keep their morale up because they, they sang songs with it. But of course, Hurley had 400 glass plates and him and Shackleton knew that was too many. So what him and what Hurley and Shackleton did, they stood by the endurance and they, in the same way we do on our phones, when we like photos and delete them, they liked and deleted almost two or 300 photos. And Hurley was only allowed to bring back 140 glass plates, which the RGS is really privileged to have. And to stop Hurley going back and choosing his favorite photos, they smashed them. So he knew he couldn't bring them back. So there are 140 photos of these glass plates. I'm just going to put these gloves on so I can show you one of the originals. And these are, they weigh about the, the weight of a small book. So if you just excuse me while I put this, this. Steve, while you get the gloves on, um, I, I I want to just think about that. I want us to like make sure we think about that. I know I, know I have my phone here. Um, sometimes I'm going through and I, I'm getting too, I have too much, uh, too many photos. I have to delete a few and I'm always like, oh, I really like that photo, but I don't, I don't have the space for it anymore. Uh, imagine having to do that and pick out of, out of 400, you only have 140 left and, and which ones do you have to do it? And knowing that as soon as you say, I don't know about that one, it gets smashed. So you, so your decision is made for you. Um, I also want to want to be able to tell all, all the students this is a great activity for those of you who are who are out there. Th imagine oh, you only have two pounds. You have two pounds of things. What things would you take with you if you had to abandon ship on endurance? What things would you take with you and why? Imagine what those things would be for you. Um, I think we would have some interesting answers. Um, all right, Steve. Yeah, there's an amazing story as well because Shackleton was given a Bible, a big Bible, that's about this size, by the Queen of England. Um, and he took that on the endurance. And of course, for, for Shackleton, who was very practically minded, the Bible was going to be too heavy to carry back for everybody. So what Shackleton did was tear out the, uh, the first page that had been scribed by the Queen and also tear out Psalm 23 as well that he read to the crew. And he gently put the Bible down on the, uh, on the surface of the ice to leave because the men were throwing out you know, equipment and, and stores and so on. One of his crew members, a guy called McLeod, unbeknown to Shackleton, picked the Bible up and put it into a big pocket of his greatcoat and hid it. He wasn't supposed to be doing this because Shackleton also had loads of gold coins and threw those on the ground because they're going to be useless to anybody in Antarctica now. But the crewman and McLeod brought the Bible back and subsequently gave it to the, the, the RGS and you can find a picture of that that Bible in our in our archives. But let me just show you this. This is really, really irreplaceable. Uh, I've got to be very, very careful with this. It's one of the, the Hurley glass plates. And you can see, I'm going to bring it right up to the camera. Hopefully we can see it. You can see it's a negative. And then when they produce a print from it, it becomes a positive print. This image you can see to my side is the same image in that really big print. And I think one of the, like Chris was saying, to think about, you know, reduce, you know, whether you take two pounds of equipment or what pictures you save. One of the amazing things about Frank Hurley, who was such a good photographer, is there's barely a bad picture in the entire collection. So he only took a few hundred pictures in total. And here's just one of them. But they were so well considered. And you can see here, the white image at the top, I have to be very, I better not drop this because I'll get in trouble if, if I do. Here is Shackleton leaning over the ship, looking at the, um, looking at the endurance trapped in the ice. And if I just go back to the large picture over here, we might be able to zoom in. Here's Shackleton in real life, again, looking over the ice, just wondering what was going on. I'll take these little gloves off so I can pick up the things up. Amazing. I before before we we go a little bit deeper into that into that photo, um, I do know that our our friends at PS One they're going to have to leave in just a few minutes for um, for lunch. It is getting close to lunchtime here here in the states, uh, and I want to and I, I can see that we have a student who's been waiting very patiently with a question. So um, if we can if we can switch over to Brooklyn, I I want to uh, ask away. Hi, my name is Juliet, and I have a question. As a museum, what would we like to have come from endurance? I'm I'm just gonna rephrase that um, for you. Juliet would like to know if it were possible to bring up artifacts from the endurance firm for a museum exhibition. 
what would you really like to see? What would you like to bring up? Thanks, Julia. It's a really interesting question. And, and you might have seen from a previous wreck when people found the wreck of uh, the Titanic, some artifacts were collected from the Titanic. And actually, there's a really big debate about whether wrecks should be left as they are, particularly if people died on the wrecks because they're treated as burial sites like the, the um, Titanic wreck. Fortunately, and luckily, and as we know, the amazing story of Shackleton, nobody died on endurance. So it's not considered a burial site. But in Antarctica, there's lots of protection. As Chris said, 100 years ago, people used to be able to um, uh, go whaling and kill whales for, for their blubber and their oil and their bones. That's all prohibited. You can't hunt for whales in Antarctica at all. And there's lots of protection for the land, for the sea, for the ice. And you're not allowed to bring in any foreign um, species. So if you travel into Antarctica, you have to disinfect your boots and be very careful. You can't interfere with the wildlife. So you can't go trying to cuddle penguins or anything like that. You have to leave them in their natural state. And those sorts of rules and all the governments that help, that join together to manage Antarctica, they've decided that things like wrecks probably should be left. So even though there's amazing artifacts on, on endurance, I think keeping true to that spirit of, of trying to protect Antarctica, and it's, a, it's the only continent in the world where governments don't claim land anymore. So there's no countries on Antarctica and all the governments work together for conservation, for peace and for science. I think it's probably best if I say, even though there'd be lovely things to look at, probably the best place for those things is still in Antarctica because that's keeping the spirit of how people manage Antarctica today. I, okay. I, I think that's a really good answer. I think, I think especially because if we remember the pictures that, we, that we've been able to see of endurance, that, that we want to remember that there are things that call endurance their home now, that they live in 10,000 feet of water. There are, um, there are all sorts of, of in, invertebrates, um, so things without backbones, so sea anemones, sea stars. Uh, I believe we've even seen crabs, which is something that, that we, we didn't even know were able to live down there. And they all have uh, endurance as their home. And so we want to make sure that if, if there is a decision in the future about what to recover, we don't want to disturb those animals because they're, they're, we don't know how many there might be. They, there could only be a few. We didn't even know that they existed. And so trying to figure out what we can do for historical value, but also respecting the living things that are there is really important. All of that being said, all of that being said, I do know from, from reading a lot about endurance that they, there's a lot of really interesting things in the storehouse that there, there's a, a storage area um, in the hold of endurance that they they were trying to get to as it was being crushed and it had already flooded and they, they couldn't get some of the things that they really wanted out of it. I think it'd be really cool if they, if you couldn't if they couldn't disturb uh, if they didn't weren't able to disturb any of the living things that were there to try and recover like old tins of biscuits or or something like that. Uh, I think that would be really I, I think that would be really cool. <laughs> I, I just add to what Chris is saying, Julia. Endurance is two miles down on the seabed in a part of the world that very few people have ever visited. And for half the year, it's covered in ice. So it's really difficult to get there at all. I mean, and the, 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 the Aguinas to the, the research ship was really, I mean, really specialist science and very skilled people to get there. But many people have tried this and been, very, been unsuccessful in the past. Yeah, ec excellent question. Um, I know you have to leave in just one minute. If there's another student who has a question, you guys have been so patient and, and waiting. We'd love to see if we could answer maybe one more before you have to break. Right, say uh, your name. My name is John Luca, and my question is, um, why, why do you need three ships just for one thing? Ooh, good question. I didn't quite catch the question. Perhaps Chris, could you repeat it for me? Yeah. So he he wants to know why why you needed why there were three ships. I think I think he may be referring to the fact that there were there were once the endurance was crushed, there were three um, three boats. Maybe you can talk about the the abandoned ship. Um, talk a little bit about that that portion of the of the expedition when they were trying to survive. 
Yeah, there's there's a photo that might be useful to go to that uh, the three school boats on Elephant Island. If if we can just jump ahead to that, and I'll explain this this for actually. Uh, yeah, keep going. Yeah, that's the one. So, John Luca, there was the big expedition ship called Endurance, the one that has sails that sailed all the way down from the the UK to Antarctica. And on that ship, they had these three small little boats. And they were given names by people who were given money for the expedition, a bit like sponsors today. So there was somebody called James Caird who given money, somebody called Dudley Docker, and somebody called Stanton well Wills. And parts of Antarctica are also named after people who gave money to these expeditions. There's a Beardsmore Glacier that was one of the other sponsors of funders to, to these sort of expeditions previously 100 years ago. So these are the small... Small little boats they'd use. If they were in a, a port, they'd use this from getting from the big ship endurance to the shore. They'd use these as life vessels. And they were you know, really fortunate to have these because these became their lifeline. So once their big ship had been crushed, they camped on the ice. They filled these boats with supplies. And then when it became the Antarctic summer, our winter in the northern hemisphere, so it's the Antarctic summer. It's not really warm in the Antarctic, but it's the summer in Antarctica currently. What they're able to do is gaps or what you call leads in the ice broke up. The men got into these three boats and sailed for three days and three nights constantly. They were really worried about losing touch with each other. One of the ways they tried to signal to each other is they lit matches and held them up against the sails that sort of provided a bit of a lantern to show where they were. And luckily... All the three boats, and you can see them on the beach here, arrived at a small island called Elephant Island. And that's where they could then subsequently sail to get help from. And you can see members of the crew here in Elephant Island. Elephant Island was the first time in 500 days that the men had actually stood on solid ground. Really quick, okay. sorry to interrupt, but I, I do want to make sure we can bring um, PS1 on stage because they're so or on, on camera because they do have to go. We do want to stay there. Bye-bye. Uh, thank you so much ps1 um but it's a it but sorry to interrupt steve but that's a it's a great question it's a great question to understand that um that these these boats were used both as lifeboats but also as i think the term would be today as as tenders um as as smaller boats that could that were a little bit more nimble to get in and out of areas where otherwise the the larger the more displacement of, of a, a heavier ship might scrape in a, in a shallower harbor. Uh, but but when when the endurance was crushed, this was their only chance to get to safety. Yeah, and when they arrived at Elephant Island, you can see the, the crew having that, the first time they'd had some proper food and drink for three days. They then had to pull these little boats ashore onto the beach. They built small little walls with rocks on the beach and turned the three boats upside down to form a hut and and it was the men smoked and they had fires and and what they did was kill penguins and seals for food and also they used the blubber from the penguins and seals you can't do it in antarctica today but they could 100 years ago they used the blubber to to cook with and to form lights with to to, to illuminate the area but blubber burns with lots of very black sooty smoke so the men were covered in this sticky black smoke in these badly ventilated, in this badly ventilated hut with these three three boats upside down, and they called them the styes, which is a sort of shorthand for a pigsty because they were so filthy and, and sort of dirty. And when Shackleton, as we know, he sailed in one of these boats to get the rescue, when the rescue ship finally set sail, Shackleton had obviously been able to get clean, had shaved, had got new clothes. And his men didn't recognize him because they were so used to seeing him with a beard, dirty, filthy, in the same clothes. And it was only when he shouted, it's all well, and the, the uh, Tom Crean shouted back, all well, boss, because they called him boss, that they recognized who he was from his voice. But they didn't actually recognize him when he returned to save them all. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it, I think it's, it's sometimes hard for us in, in the comfort of, of our of modern day to to understand the um, the importance of get, doing what needs to be done to survive 
mm-hmm. and and the the work that that the men who were behind on Elephant Island and and those who went forward on the Caird, um, to who all did exactly what they needed to do. Uh, I I um, there's just so many amazing stories about about all of those things, uh, and I I but. but Rather than jumping into those, I, I have a ton of questions to ask you, Steve. I but I, I there's some in the chat that I, I'd like to get to instead. So uh, Messiah from Miss Turney's class in St. Louis, Missouri, uh, wants to know more about the artifacts that you have at the Royal Geographical Society. Um, so we know the glass plate that's incredible. We see some of the the, the blown up photos um, that were developed from those plates behind you. Um, if you can talk maybe a little bit about some of the other things that RGS has, especially as they pertain to the Imperial Trans-Antarctic Expedition. So we, we, have, we have some materials. So I've talked about the glass plates and these amazing 140 remaining glass plates. We also have some photographic albums that we're able to print images from. We have some other Shackleton materials. So we have some items from one of his earlier expeditions where he got, this was before the Trans-Imperial Expedition, the Endurance Expedition, where he got with two members of his crew within 100 miles of the pole. This is in, in an expedition about eight or nine years earlier. And they stopped 100 miles from the pole. And Shackleton knew they had enough food and supplies to get to the pole. And had they done that, they'd have been the first ever people to reach the South Pole before Scott and Allenton. But what Shackleton also knew is they didn't have enough supplies to get home and they would die on the way back. They wouldn't have enough food, they wouldn't have enough fuel. And we have some material from that expedition. And when Shackleton was talking with his wife when he got home, there's a very famous quote from him, uh, because some people wondered whether he should have carried on and had a heroic death trying to get to the pole or not. And he said to his wife, he said, I'd sooner you have a live donkey than a dead lion. And I think that decision he made to bring his men safely back been so close to the pole in an earlier expedition carries through in the trans imperial expedition where he got everybody back safely and it's you know they were stuck in the ice nobody was going to come and rescue them you know there was the first world war on here in europe and i know those of you dying from america america joined the war in 1917 and the first world war started in 1914 in britain shackleton and his crew had no idea whether the war had finished or not And actually, when many of them were rescued, some of the first questions they had was, is the war still going on? And the war still continued. The First World War continued to 1918. And many of them, well, all the men on their return either joined the Navy, the Army, or the the Merchant Navy. And three of them died in the war, in the First World War, and a number of were were injured in the war too. And Hurley actually became a, a war photographer, having taken all the endurance images. So we have some other material. And there's lots of other Shackleton objects in other collections and museums around the UK. So the banjo I talked about, the Hussey play, that's down in the museum in Exeter. And there's a a museum in Cambridge called the Poland Museum that has a whole range of other materials as well. So we have lots of lots of art. Yeah. So there, so you, you just mentioned two things that I, I, I think are, are I, I wanted to just bring in a, another little fun thing for, for those of you who are, who are watching out there. Number one, the war had begun to break out in, for World War I as the endurance was sailing uh, from England down towards South America and eventually on. And so when they made port and they found out, they, they weren't sure whether or not they should continue. That was this important enough, given that there was this world war that was breaking out, and there's this famous there's this famous conversation uh, between Shackleton and the and the British Navy, where Sir Winston Churchill um, actually sent back a I believe it was a telegraph message saying, "Proceed." Yeah, it was and, one word, just proceed. And Shackleton had offered to put all of his crew. We lost, we lost your camera there. We can hear you, but we lost your camera. Yeah, I don't, let me just see if there's a... <laughs> um, while, while you do that, um, while you do that, I, I, will, uh, I will say it's, it's, a, it's a very famous little, little story where, where the, the expedition almost didn't happen because of that. And, and also, the, um, the, as we were talking before about that two pounds, there was one exception that was made, um, or, or there was a couple exceptions that were made um, about each member of the crew being able to take on more than just that um that that two pound limit 
Oh, there we go. I can see you again. Um, and and the 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 exception, one of the exceptions was was Leonard Hussey had a it was a banjo, correct? That's right. Yeah, it was a banjo. Um, and so and so Hussey um, um, Hussey was able to take that banjo um, with him, even though that was far heavier than two pounds, because Shackleton knew that this would keep everyone's spirits up. And one of the famous songs that they played, and I know they played this on the essay Gullis too, one, one of the evenings when they were trying to keep their hopes up, um, I believe someone performed The Long Road to Tipperary, which is a, a song not as popular here in the States, but quite popular in the UK. You'll be able to find it on YouTube. It's, it's a sort of Irish song and, and very much speaks to Shackleton, who was born in Ireland, his the sort of Irish roots. And as well as singing, we might want to just pull up the, um, there's a photo of the guys on the ice enjoying themselves with a football match. Mm -hmm. So they, you know, they had to focus, they had to do all the work of the expedition, but there was also time for, for relaxing and fun. Um, and as, you know, there we go, there's a face of, of them all on the ice. I don't know who won, I don't know what team they had and who won the match. <laughs> I'm not sure whether they put Shackleton in goal or not, but, you know, they, they obviously had to do lots of other things to make sure their morale was kept up during the, the expedition as well. And and I we we did hear from Tim on their last day on the ice. There were quite a number of different um, pieces of sporting equipment that were brought by members of the of the crew and expeditionary team uh, on the SA Gullis too. I, I believe I heard that there might have been some cross country skis. I, I heard there was a, a couple of rugby balls, um, football or soccer balls. Um, there are all sorts of things <laughs> to be able to do that, and especially to honor honor the fact that that this was the same thing that had happened over a hundred years before. Now I, ha I have two questions from the chat that I would love to ask you um, because I actually don't know the answer to either of these. So our friends in Texas um, asked a really great question, which was, um, did Shackleton ever meet de Garlache? Um, uh, and forgive, forgive my, my poor pronunciation. Uh, the Polaris, which was the original name for endurance was, a, was originally commissioned by de Garlache. Um, do you know Shackleton ever met them? Um the short answer is I, I genuinely don't know. Um, <laughs> that's the best answer I could give. I'm afraid I'm like you, Chris. I, you know, I'd have to go back through the archives to check. But yes, yes the, the endurance was a, named a different ship before Shackleton took it on. And yeah. I'm sure many of the people in the chat will know his family motto was to by endurance we conquer. And the name of the ship reflects his family motto. It's very mm -hmm. apt for the, the work he did. Absolutely, and I, and I the one thing I do know about about the the original the original ship originally known as Polaris now now um, now obviously known as Endurance was that it was commissioned I believe in Norway and um, it was it was originally for Arctic uh, Arctic uh, uh, um, expeditionary work and and work up there and it was it was Shackleton who saw the that it was a perfect fit for what he wanted to do in the South Pole. Now, the, um, I see a question from Eric Malcolm, and I, this, is, this is a great question. Um, again, I don't know. Um, what happened to the two remaining boats on Elephant Island? So the Stancombe Willis and, yeah. um, and the yeah. Dudley Docker. So Shackleton took the James Cairdin sail to South Georgia to get help. The Stancombe Willis and the Dudley Docker were left on, uh, on, um, on Elephant Island, and the men lived in these awful, smoky, horrible conditions. And uh, it's, it's, it's a little bit screamish, but one of the, there was a stowaway at the start of the journey called Black Barrow, a young, the youngest member of the crew who stowed away for an adventure. Who'd have thought he'd end up in this sort of adventure? When they were sailing to Elephant Island, he got frostbite on his toes. And, and they, in, under the, the, the turned up uh, boats, they performed an operation. They had ether that's a gas that could knock him out. They boiled water. They cut off his frostbitten toes and made sure that was all safe and protected. And then I think they used leftover water to, to have a wash because they not actually had a wash for, for, for much of that time. So that was happening under the Dudley Docker and the um, Stancombe Wills. Of course, the men left behind on Elephant Island didn't know what had happened to Shackleton. And they not heard any news. There was no way of hearing any news. So what they'd actually started to do was to prepare one of the boats to sail again to try and sail to, um, to Elephant Island. So there was, as Shackleton, and it took Shackleton three goes to, to bring the rescue ship to Elephant Island, they were actually preparing to set sail with another team that would have gone off to Elephant Island in either the Stancombe Wills or the Dudley Docker. Um, and I, they, those boats, I believe, were just left when they, uh, 
when they rescued the men for Ellington Island. Shackleton was so keen to get the men off when he brought the rescue ship up. And I think there's a little picture of the, the rescue ship arriving in, in one of the later slides. When he arrived, he was so keen. Here we are that you can see there's a, a it's a, 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 you can see the men waving and that's seen off the James Caird. That's a big picture. Wishing them well, you know, can you imagine being one of those men wishing off the, the James Caird in certain knowledge of the danger they were facing, but hoping about, amongst hope they were going to come back. The smaller photo, there's a small ship on the horizon called the Jelco, which is a Chilean um, tugboat. And that's the boat that brought everybody to the safety. And you can see they, they sent off one of the smaller boats from, from the Jelco to come to the island. Shackleton was on that small boat. He was so keen to get everybody off. He refused to get off the boat to set foot back on Elephant Island because he just wanted all of his men into the small boat, back to the Jelco, and then they could bring them back to safety from South Georgia. Oh, amazing. Um, the, I, I, I'm, these, these are, I, I, I know these images and, and it's, it's there, the, I, I, one of the things that stuck with me from, from the, um, from the, the, the larger picture on the left is, is that the, the crew is waving the, uh, the James Caird uh, goodbye um, as it's setting off for South Georgia. And, and the, the, everyone knew that this could be the last time that they saw the boss, that they, that they could see Shackleton because it was, they had, the, the Caird had to go through 800 miles of, of open sea. And, and the, the, the thought that this might be the last time that they, they see anyone else um, was, was very much uh, a part of that. And one of the important things that they had to do on, on Elephant Island was to keep that morale high to be able to, to just hold on until, until they could be rescued. Um, so we have a lot of really great questions in the chat. I apologize in advance. We're not going to be able to get to everyone because we're at, it's a, it's a, it, we only have a few minutes left. Um, but um, I, I want to try and get through these, these a little um, through relatively quickly. Um, so I have a question from, from Michelle, um, and this is an interesting one. Uh, when endurance was discovered on March 5th, um, the, uh, the um, she says was the boon that was attached to the bow for Hurley to film located in the debris field near the wreck. Um, that's an interesting question. I don't know the answer to that. I'm not sure, Steve, if you do either. I'm not sure, because there was. Um, thank you for the question, Michelle. There was a, a sort of debris field of other materials around the ship, and I think all of us, both those of us involved at a distance, people on on the Aguilas too and probably people all around the world. When we saw those pictures of the endurance on the seabed, I was expecting to see a smashed up wreck with sort of bits of wood just smashed up, unrecognizable as a ship. And then you see the ship, not in perfect condition, but recognizable as the endurance uh, with the endurance written across her stern at the back and the prow at the front. And it was just a really, here we go, a really remarkable pictures. And as Chris said, you can see some of the, the uh, aquatic wildlife on there. It, I, we were all just genuinely stunned to see how intact the endurance actually was. And I think it's real testament to the strength of these you know, polar uh, going ships that even though she'd been crushed, she still had a lot of integrity in her, in her hull and the, the sort of infrastructure around it. You could still see the ship's wheel, some of the cabin areas, the portholes, and so on. And uh, it was really remarkable sort of pictures. And the, there's a little video you can look at as well online around it too. Yeah, you can go right to reachtheworld.org to the Endurance 22 expedition and, and see that that 4K footage. Uh, it, absolutely incredible stuff. And um, also we can see in that photo, there's a sea anemone there uh, doing its best uh, impression from the movie Titanic. Um, and, but I think the incredible thing is that you can see the down to the rivets. Yeah, that, that, is, that is the incredible uh, uh, state that the ship was in. So, um, so the, the question I'd like to, an, uh, uh, to end on, um, I see that that our friends in St. Louis are asking some wonderful questions. Thank you, Miss Turney. Thank you, Miss Turney students. You are always in just thoughtful in your questions. Um, I know we we answered one in the chat about the height of the mountains on Elephant Island, um, but the 
but Simone wanted to was wondering how Hurley was able to get his his shots from so high without a drone. Um, that there's there's a couple images where where he has this this really great um, perspective, and I wonder if we can just maybe go back to um, to the to you and 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 just maybe the place where we can end before we go into a fun little activity for everyone um, is just talk a little bit more about those those images that um, the Royal Geographic Society has. Maybe if we go on to slide six, I can just, uh, I might be able to sort of illustrate this because we've got a nice picture. There's the endurance sailing in full sail, sailing through the ice before she got trapped. And Simone, as you rightly say, the pictures look like he, you know, he'd used a drone. Well, of course, they didn't have drones in those days. <laughs> So what Hurley did was get right up high into the masts and the rigging, right at the very top. And we do have some pictures of him with this big box camera that's the size of, well, um, huge box, but a, a big box camera, no, just box cameras, big box camera up in the rigging, taking photographs. And he also strapped himself onto the boom out, out of the, the bow of the ship to take moving footages. And he had a, a moving uh, film camera as well. And there's moving footage of the uh, film footage of the expeditions. But there are some pictures you can find online on the RGS site and elsewhere of Hurley right up at the top of the, uh, you know, right in the crow's nest at the top of these, uh, at the top of the spars. And I, I, I'm not, I'm not going to guess how high it was, but he must have had a very good, a very good head for heights, but also lots of support to take him up there to make sure he didn't fall off with the, with the pictures too. And he knew he was only able to take one or two pictures of the glass plates. You know, he couldn't just shoot off loads and loads of pictures. So very considered photographer and very able photographer as well. It, and and I think all of us who are who are interested in the history of this to be able to have access to what to 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 really what people were seeing and to to be able to then infer what they were feeling and thinking from these images. It's it's truly amazing. And and I think uh, I think we have such such appreciation for Hurley to be able to do that and to be able to bring those back. Um, so I, I, I want us to end um, on on this uh, really amazing activity uh, that that Steve had had shared with us and I and I'm putting it out to all of you out there that please do this and, and share with both us at Race the World and our friends at the Royal Geographical Society. Um, if you do have a chance to do it to please do so but uh, we want you to to be a little artistic and build your own uh, endurance. So, so uh, we've got a little video that's that's going to run just for the last sort of minute or so, and it gives you instructions. All you need is a paper plate, three or four straws, a bit of imagination, and um, hopefully we'll we'll run shortly. And you'll see some instructions for how you can build. Here we go. How you can build your own endurance against a map of Antarctica, you can see the Antarctic Peninsula there. So you don't need many, you don't really need many, uh, many bits of equipment. And I, I think I, myself, Chris, colleagues at the RGS and colleagues at Reach World would like to, we know Shackleton faced a big challenge, getting, getting to Antarctica and getting all of his crew safely home. But we think this is a nice little challenge for you to do so whether in your classes, whether in lunchtime or at home, we'd love you to try and make your own endurance. You can follow these instructions. There's links, they'll be shared. There's links on the RGS website to find them as well. We'd love to see what you come up with. And you can see our designer, Daryl, he's creating the ice that, that trapped the endurance. There's her spars and the mass that Hurley went up to. You can see the outline of Antarctica in the background. On the left of the screen is Weddell Sea where the endurance wreck was, was found. You can colour in the Southern Ocean, the Ross Sea, the Weddell Sea that surround Antarctica. And of course, these freeze during the Antarctic winter. You can do the outline of the continent itself. And then we'd love you to, in the best you can, create and paint up your own ship and add as many details as you can. You can see Daryl here just adding a bit of extra on the coastline maybe mark on elephant island which is to the left of this picture at the end of the peninsula you can see the peninsula up at the top left of the picture and she won't be as seaworthy as as endurance was hopefully she won't have end up at the bottom of the ocean but we'd love to see your creations and please do share them both with reach the world and with with the rgs as well and on the rgs site if you find 
digest.org endurance 22 you'll find lots of resources to support the work that you can also get through reach the world as well so um yeah sure yeah, Chris, is that a good point to giving everybody a challenge to, to leave the, the challenge? Yeah, absolutely. And I think the 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 the, the resource is really fun. I, I love the idea of, of getting students because as a former social studies teacher, teaching students geography is something near and dear to my heart. I know Dr. John Shears, the expedition leader of the Endurance 22 expedition, is a geogra geographer. Yeah. That's what he has his PhD in, and he would love to be able to see that that work, that map. But I also think that that the creativity in our classrooms is, is unparalleled and the, the work that our teachers do. So also use that that paper plate you can do it you can put it on on antarctica and and recreate exactly what rgs and daryl have done but if you have some other background for endurance to be leaping out of please use 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 your creativity and uh, just be sure to share it with us share it with the royal geographical society uh, this is a friendly reminder too we have a padlet up for everyone to be able to share reflections with not only reach the world, but the crew and the expeditionary team. Um, so please, if you haven't contributed to our Padlet yet, now is the time to do so. Uh, but but overall, we we love being able to hear from you all about what you're doing to, to capture the excitement and interest and the amazing work that has been uh, done uh, alongside you all, uh, you all following from around the world on the Endurance 22 expedition. So um, so that being said, Steve, it was so wonderful to speak with you. Thank you so much for sharing your your knowledge of the expedition, the incredible artifacts that you have, and and uh, and so many other um, so much other insights. Uh, I, I've been so lucky to work with you and the Royal Geographical Society, not just on the Endurance Twenty Two expedition, but also on the Weddell Sea expedition from the 2018-2019 school year. And I'm so excited to have Reach the World continue to work with RGS into the future. That's great, Chris. I'll just leave you all just with one, one thought. We, we started this talk with that map that had unexplored. And I think what's true today is there's not many ma maps that have unexplored. So we're, we're not really looking to explore blank bits of the map, but the really key thing for all of us today and going forward is to better understand what's on the map. And I think thinking of all of you in your classrooms, you can be those explorers of the next generation that help us better understand the world's people, the world's places, and the world's environments. And that means you're getting out and visiting them and, and better understanding them. So, you know, you may not discover new places, but you can discover new understanding. And I'll leave you with that thought as, as we go forward. So lovely to meet you all. Hope that's useful. And we'll see you again another time, I'm sure. Steve said it better than I could. Thank you all. And we'll see you next week when we bring back Tim to talk a little bit about wildlife. Good to see you all, folks. Bye, everyone.